We're in Ephesians today. We're starting a new series uh, through the book of Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians. Um, now, we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 today. This is the introduction to the letter of Ephesians. But this series is entitled, you ready for it? Yeah. Ephesians. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be going through Ephesians for probably about the next 20 weeks. There's so much here. But the subtitle to the series is called, it's, it's Unity in Divisive Times. Unity in divisive times. I think we can all agree that we live in very divisive times, do we not? There's division along all kinds of areas of our society. And here's the thing. The sad news is that the church of Jesus Christ is, is not immune to division. In fact, lots of times the things that go on in the larger culture outside of these walls end up permeating and making their way into the body of Christ. And since we are in a society that is so rife with division, and this year is a, pol a, a very political year, being in a presidential election year, I felt that it would be prudent to cover a book where we would talk about unity within the body of Christ. What do we unify around? Who are we? How can we be unified? I hope to unpack that a little bit this morning. Um, now, the book of Ephesians, it's actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul, and it's given as a what's called a circular letter. A circular letter was a letter written to not just one recipient, but actually to many. And so, the, uh, the Ephesian church, which Ephesus was a city in Asia Minor, um, the Ephesian church was who the, the letter was initially directed toward, from Paul, writing from prison, and then he would, he, he would send that to, Ephes to, to Ephesus, and then that, they would take that letter, they would read it aloud, they would make a copy of it, and then they would send that letter to the next city, to the next church. And so we can see this, um, this book is not just um, to one church or one person, but it's to the church at large, which we are a part of. The letter can be broken into two primary parts. It's, we break it into six chapters, um, which by the way, the chapters in the, in the divisions within the Bible, they're not inspired. They're just pragmatic. They're practical because if I told you the uh, mention a part of Ephesians, then it'd be really hard to find what I was talking ab about. But if I say chapter three, verse such and such, so the chapters and verses were added later. We divided the book of Ephesians into six different chapters, and uh, you could divide Ephesians really into two separate parts of the letter. The first part of the letter, Ephesians one through three, are, um, are really theological in its purpose. It's, it's helping us understand some deep theological truths, um, truths that have to do with the concepts of grace and faith and adoption and justification and what we do with our good works. What are good works? And, of course, unity in the body of Christ. And then all of those theological concepts are then given practical footing in chapters 4 through 6. Um, Paul expounds on how we apply those theological truths practically in our lives and within the body of Christ. So, uh, over the next few weeks, we are going to, uh, next good while, we're going to be going through Ephesians, and we're centered on unity, because ultimately, Ephesians is a book about unity. You guys ready to rock? Yeah. <laughs> they are. All right, um, I want to invite you to stand. We're going to read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, just two verses today. Ephesians 1, 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That may seem like such a simple passage, but there's a much to expound upon there. So let's pray, and we'll jump in. Father, this morning I ask that you more deeply reveal who you are to us as we seek to grow more deeply in knowing who you are through your word. May we have the ears to hear you this morning. And Father, I ask that you speak 
whether it's through me, other means, you've already spoken through your word. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take a seat. I've got two points for you this morning. First, and really both points are centered on verse 2. There's a lot to be said on verse 1, um, but we're going to focus on verse 2. And uh, point 1 this morning is only God gives genuine grace and peace. Only God gives genuine grace and peace. If you look with me again at verse 2, Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul states that grace and peace come from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This idea is very contrary to what our society claims. Our society doesn't doesn't claim that, that peace comes from those sources, but rather other sources. And we are a society, if we just look at our culture, I think we can all see that we are a society that's filled with a lack of peace. Around the world, within our city, within our area, within our country, we're filled with a lack of peace. There's political turmoil, there's war, there's famine in different places around the world. There's division within our society along worldview lines. We can see it probably more now than we ever have. There is division because of all of this that is being brought up within friendships, within relationships, within families, within the church. And then there is even a lack of personal peace. Not only is there a lack of of peace between each other, so we, we call that like horizontal peace, but there's a lack of internal peace. We're the most medicated society ever. Right now, we have more mental health disorders in our society than ever. And particularly, the younger generation. The generation that is most diagnosed with mental disorders is the generation that is currently in middle school and high school. And we, we have this internal lack of peace, and we may medicate it away with, with prescriptions, but lots of us medicate it away in other ways. And I, I'm not just talking about substances. I'm talking about power. I'm talking about control. I'm talking about all kinds of things we try to grasp at to give us an ounce of peace. But it doesn't work, does it? If you were to ask our society where peace comes from, we'd well, get all kinds of different answers, would we not? One person would say peace comes through power. One person would say peace comes through control. One, one person would say peace comes through money. Another person would come, say that peace comes through kindness. Another person would, would say that peace comes through equality. Another one would say through division. Another one would say through pleasure. Another one would say through hardships. Another one would, would say through discovering your true self. Whatever we think it would be, we think that peace comes in some kind of circumstance. All of those things are lies. Genuine, real peace doesn't come through those means, at least not in its entirety. For a moment, you can have an ounce of peace because you have a little bit more money to pay the bills. Or you might be able to have a little bit more peace because you have just that little bit more control on whatever it is you're trying to get control of. But goodness, that peace is fleeting, isn't it? I know I'm not the only one who at a point in my life when I had less money than I do now, which I don't have much, but at a point in my life where I had less, I thought if I just had more money, if I had that my life would be fulfilled and at peace. And then eventually I got that, and guess what? It didn't change a thing. Because peace, genuine peace, doesn't come from our circumstances. All all peace outside of God is counterfeit. Or, Or better yet, it treats our symptoms, 
All, all peace that we seek to get outside of Christ treats our symptoms and not the actual problem. You've been there? I was there um, when, whenever I was in my 20s, early 20s, I got an opportunity to go do some, some uh, mission work in China, and it was awesome. I loved it, um, and God, God did some great things while I was there, and I spent about half of a summer in, in China. It was really fun. But while I was there, as many of us maybe have experienced when you travel overseas, is I got a stomach bug. Yeah. And at first I thought, hey, I'm champ. I can get through this. Went to the store. I went to the local drugstore and got um, some over-the-counter meds that would help with my stomach issues. Took them. Kind of helped a little bit. But then the next day, I still had those stomach issues. So took, took more meds, and the next day, still had those stomach issues, right? Because the meds I was taking weren't treating the root issue. In fact, uh, the people that I was living with at the time, they, they saw that I was having these issues, and my over-the-counter meds were not working, although they made me feel a little bit more pleasant in the moment. They, they recommended that I w- would go see a Chinese massage person. Has anyone here gotten a Chinese massage before? I'm not talking about a Thai massage or any of those. Chinese massage is like on a whole other level of pain, okay? (laughs) It was not a pleasant experience whatsoever. Um, So they they made me go, and uh, I went a few times, which is saying something about me. But anyways, I, I went the, this first time, and, um, and they said, yeah, he can treat anything. You have stomach issues, he will fix it. And so he did all these weird things where he like um, almost felt like he dug a hole in my stomach, um, and it was outrageously painful. And guess what happened at the end of that? Nothing! Except for pain. <laughs> it didn't change a thing. Even though one thing, I said this to the first service, I'll say you, this to you guys too. Um, one thing I learned while I was there is, so I, I was, he did the whole stomach thing, didn't work. And then uh, he said, is there anything else going on? I was like, well, I have a lot of congestion going on. And he said, oh, I can handle that. And he made me take off my shoe. It's like, not what you think he would do. And uh, he grabbed my foot and he started feeling around on it. And then he was like, all right, hold on, here we go. Bam! And he hit my foot super hard, so hard. It was so painful. But then in the midst of all that, all of a sudden, my nose just started gushing out. And I'm like, okay, there's something to this, but whatever he did for my stomach didn't work, okay? Um, Because um, it, it, uh, it didn't really change the symptoms, and, and then even the medication that I was taking, it made me feel a little bit more pleasant temporarily, but it didn't make the sickness go away. And I was blessed to have another missionary from a different part of China who came to visit us, and when he came, he, uh, he had some, some antibiotics that were for this purpose. And he said, I'm pretty sure I know what you have going on, and I've got something that you can treat it with. And so he gave me some antibiotics, and I remember I took it around dinner time, and the next morning around breakfast, I finally started getting an appetite back, and some of the symptoms were going away, and within about 24 hours, my sickness was gone. Why? Because I was, I I got medication the antibiotic that treated the bacterial infection, it it treated the actual issue and not just giving me something to cover up the symptom. I tell you this because we do this with things that we think give us peace, satisfaction, or whatever we want to call it in this life. No matter what we do, if we seek peace outside of God, it will only ever treat the symptoms and not the core issue. And that's because the core issue of our peace is not an internal peace, and it's not a horizontal peace with other people. Actually, our core issue with peace is in our most fundamental and important relationship of our existence, and it's a vertical peace. See, We are, Scripture tells us this in vivid detail, and we're going to talk about it in the coming weeks, especially when we get to Ephesians chapter 2, where we see that we are people who are not naturally at peace with God. 
We are, called God, we are called rebels against God's cause. And in fact, Scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that we were dead in our sins and our trespasses against God. We're not at peace with God naturally. And that's the most fundamental relationship in our existence. And so no wonder we lack peace in all the other areas. However, when we have true peace, peace with God, then it flows out and it permeates every other aspect of our existence. So the question is, how do we get this peace? Well, Paul says it in our passage. He says, "Um, grace and peace to you from God the Father and Jesus Christ. Our peace that we can have with God is only able to be achieved not by something that we do or earn, but by something that Jesus has done and earned for us. He earns our peace. He pays our debt. He rights our wrong. And he gives it to us by grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, Paul brings up this idea. He's talking about horizontal peace, but he relates it to the vertical peace that is at the core of it all. In Ephesians 2, verses 13 through 17, he says this, But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, by his sacrifice. For he himself is our, can we say it together? Peace. Peace. Yes. He himself is our peace. Peace, absolutely. Um, Who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so this is the horizontal aspect, so making peace. So we see that there's peace with God, which relates then to peace with men. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. Grace and peace has been extended to you by Jesus and what he's done for you, not by something that you've earned. You can't earn grace. Because you can't earn the peace of God, that means that you can't, it can't be taken away. The grace and peace that we receive through Christ is final and complete because what Jesus has done for us on the cross makes our peace with God perfect and final and complete. And then that spills over into everything else. Now, what, I, what I'm saying, though, is not what you might be hearing. There are a lot of people that misunderstand the concept of peace that flows from God, and they think in our modern world with prosperity gospel and this idea that if you come to Jesus, then everything in your life is going to be perfect, which is not true, and it's not in Scripture, and it's a misunderstanding of what the peace of God actually is. Instead, the peace of God is not a promise that say yes to Jesus and your life is perfect, and you'll never get sick, and you never have any strife or issues or anything wrong in your life. That is not the promise of the peace of Jesus. Instead, the promise of the peace of Jesus is this. Your life will have problems, and yet in all of it, you will have peace. This is what Scripture brings up as the idea of the peace that passes understanding. Because the world sees you in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the turmoil, in the midst of the crying. This doesn't mean you don't still emotionally struggle with things. But in the midst of all of it, the world sees it and says, but there's something else. You have have a peace about you that doesn't make sense. Your circumstances are are madness, and yet you, you say you trust God? Does it make sense? This is the peace of Christ. And the way that we receive it, Scripture tells us, is simple. Repent, believe, and follow. Turn away from whatever it is that you've been pursuing in your life and pursue God. Turn away from your sin. Turn away from all of that. 
Believe in Jesus and what he's done for you, what he's earned for you, and then follow him with your life. Grace and peace can be yours today. Point two this morning is that the Father and the Son are unified. The Father and the Son are unified. So, Paul says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Before Paul encountered the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus, where he was going to persecute Christians, right? He, he was a Jew, and he would have gladly admitted, before he encountered Jesus, he would have gladly admitted that grace and peace come from God, in God alone. There is no one else that grace and peace comes from. And yet, in our statement here, he says, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. By making this statement, Paul is showing the unity of the Father and the Son in bestowing grace and peace, which is something that only God does. What he's bringing up here is just a subtle reminder of something beautiful. The grace of the Father is the grace of Christ. The peace of Christ is the peace of the Father. In Scripture, we see this beautiful unity between the Father, God, and Jesus, God, in securing, our, in securing and supplying our salvation which is something that only God can do. So this tiny little statement that you might skip right past is actually profound. And it's one of many, many, many passages that illuminate something that's called the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity. Now, um, this is one of, the doctrine of the Trinity is one of the core beliefs of Christianity. And uh, we're going to talk about it for a moment, but I'm going to just go ahead and preface this talk with, this is incomprehensible. So if you walk away saying, that confused me, you're in good company, okay? Um, but what does the word Trinity mean? The word Trinity, you might have heard it before. It is the word tri, three, and unity. Trinity, triunity. It's three and one. And did you know that the Bible never uses the word Trinity? Does that mean we made it up? Well, we made up the word to describe what we see in Scripture. And what we see in Scripture is beautiful. And I don't have the ability to fully unpack the Trinity today. Um, our Equip Pathway, one of the classes in our Equip Pathway is a theology class. And in that class, we, we will unpack the Trinity in more, in more detail but um, this morning, I, I wanted to, to bring up a few things about what the Trinity is. So the doctrine of the Trinity is this. I have it on the screen for you. There is one true God eternally existing as three distinct persons. One God, three. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing. This may seem like a contradiction, and it's incomprehensible, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But I just want to bring up how... The, the incomprehensible aspect or nature of the Trinity, of the doctrine of the Trinity, to me is comforting. Because if we looked at God and we perfectly understood Him, wouldn't that be alarming? If you could perfectly understand God, to me that would be alarming. God is the creator of our universe. He's outside of space and time. He's outside of our reality. So therefore, he must be beyond it and exist in a way that we can't fully comprehend within our existence because he created our existence. And so if we had a God, a God that we could perfectly conceptualize within our universe, then it would show that that God's false. But the doctrine of the Trinity illuminates how God is far, far beyond our ability to comprehend fully. Now, there are some misunderstandings about the doctrine of the Trinity. I want to hit four questions that I've heard many times. And those questions are, first, are Jesus and the Holy Spirit lesser gods? The answer is no. Jesus is not a lesser God. The Holy Spirit's not a lesser God. Each person of the Trinity is equally and fully God. 
but each serves different roles within the Godhead. Now, that asks the question, then begs the question, is each person of the Trinity only one-third God, and together they make the whole? So, you, did you guys ever watch Captain Planet? It's not like a, with our powers combined. It's not anything like that, right? Some of you guys have no clue what I'm talking about. You millennial people, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, no, um, each person of the Trinity, each person of the Godhead is 100% God. There is one divine essence, yet three distinct persons. So, that begs the question then, so is, is there more than one God? Well, the answer is no. No, there is only one God. There are three distinct persons of the Godhead, but they are perfectly and completely unified as one divine essence. I know, you're like, this doesn't make sense. Then the fourth question is, is there any illustration we can use that perfectly describes the Trinity? And the answer is no. Nothing within our realm of existence can accurately illustrate the triune nature of God. Because within our realm of existence, existence doesn't happen that way. But God is beyond our realm. He created our realm. And so he can exist in a way that is far beyond our ability to comprehend. Now, here's the thing. The, the doctrine of the Trinity, the reason why I bring it up is, one, because there's a lot of misunderstandings about it. A lot of people misunderstand who Jesus is and who the Holy Spirit are. And they think of Jesus and the Holy Spirit as lesser um, or they think of, of Jesus being somehow like, almost like a, like a better form of an angel or something like that, and that is not the case. Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty. He is the God of the Old Testament. He is Yahweh, and so is the Holy Spirit, and so is the Father. There are three. There are one. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity is beautiful because if we rightly grasp the mystery of the Trinity, then it begins to illuminate some aspects of the character and nature of God that may not have been previously illuminated. An example of that is, uh, for instance, 1 John 4, 8 says, uh, says something that you might have heard before. It says, God is love. God is love. And that statement from John in 1 John 4, 8 is a statement talking about God's uh, intrinsic characteristics, that He is love. He isn't, he isn't someone who figured out and began loving. He is love. He's the, He is and always has been love. It's an intrinsic part of who He is. In fact, our idea of what love is only comes because God is love the perfect example and manifestation of love. Now, if God were not triune, then he would have to create something outside of himself in order to be loving. Because a necessary attribute of love is that it's demonstrated. And so in order for God to be loving, he would have to create something outside of himself if he wasn't triune in nature, meaning that he, an intrinsic characteristic of God couldn't be that he's loving because love would only come after he created, but he would have existed before. Does this make sense? So this is something, this is a contradiction, for instance, in um, Islamic theology, that they believe that um, Allah is, is, um, is loving and divinely loving and always has been, and yet they believe that he had to create something in order to love. But does it make sense? Because he, the love would have come after the creation. But instead, through the doctrine of the Trinity, we can see the actual nature of God. And it illuminates how God can and always has been in perfect community, loving himself, but not with a self kind of love that you might think of when you think of loving yourself, but in a self-giving love because God is one and yet he's three. So the Father has always loved the Son, the Father has always loved the Spirit, and the Spirit has always loved the Father and the Son, and the Son has always loved the Father and the Spirit. They're in this beautiful dance where they are one and three and have always existed in this beautiful love. And this is why we can say God is love. 
This is just one of many areas where the doctrine of the Trinity begins to open up how we can see God. And if we understand it at a more deep level, then we begin to see the interaction between the Godhead and Scripture, where Jesus prays and looks to the Father, or Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. And we begin to see all of it in a different way when we rightly understand the mystery of the Trinity. But the thing that I bring this, the reason why I bring this up, not only because Paul mentions it, but because I think it's perfectly um, stated as we're going into a series where I want to emphasize unity in divisive times, the doctrine of the Trinity illuminates for us how fundamentally at the, at the base level of Christian belief is this idea of unity and diversity. God is one and three and three and one in a way that we can't fully comprehend, but we see this idea of diversity and unity. And as we look at the church, as you look around in this room, then you can see that we are people who are diverse. We come from all kinds of different backgrounds and walks of life and and circumstances. We're in a different place in life. Every one of us is different. We all have different gifts. We're all here for different reasons. We have different family members. We live in different places. All of it. We're, We're all so different, and yet we are one. We'll talk about this more in Ephesians, but we are one body. That's what Paul calls us. One body in Christ. And we share in one spirit, and we have one salvation. And there's one kingdom to which we labor for. As we think about and try our best to understand how we are called to unity and what looks like divisive times, we can take heart in the fact that this is at the core of our understanding of of Christianity because God himself is triune. So we are made in his image and the church, his bride, reveals his image all the more. So, of course, in his bride, the body of Christ, we will be both diverse and unified. We'll unpack this more over the next 20 weeks, and um, I am excited to do so in this theologically rich and pragmatically applicable, helpful book of Ephesians. Please stand. We're going to sing one last song about the grace of God extended to us in Christ so that we have peace, and then we'll be dismissed after that. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for revealing yourself, even though you are incomprehensible. You still, you still reveal yourself and let us embrace the mystery of who you are. Father, thank you for the grace that is extended to us in Christ. Thank you for sending Christ the Son to be our payment in earning for us peace. May we see that, may we accept that by grace through faith in him. Be with us as we sing to you, Father, inhabit the praises of your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.